Hi, good afternoon everyone. I'm going to talk about something that I was driven to by instinct. It's given me a lot of joy, but also a lot of pain. And it's zoological explorations in Singapore. I never thought I'll be spending most of my time in Singapore. I wanted to spend it in some forest far away in Borneo, but here I am exploring in my backyard. So the first question you would imagine is what forest is there? What habitat is left that Raffles saw? Is all gone? Is it? Is anything left? So this is a comparison just up to 1990 and the colours tell the story. A tale of doom, 95% loss over 183 years. We can improve that figure, no doubt, in the next 20 years. Some of this loss was recent. I was in that mangrove as a student. It suddenly appeared much brighter one night and I realised half of it had disappeared. Coral reefs, none of them are protected in Singapore. So we are the bringers of gloom and doom. Um, Love Job Sony from my department uh, is called the Doomsday Man. And he says, what you see in Singapore is the harbinger of what you'll see in Southeast Asia in the future. And it's not gone unnoticed. We're in the midst of the sixth extinction. So the United Nations has made an urgent appeal. This is the International Year of Biodiversity because we have not met targets that we are meant to meet by this year. So, is there any forest left in Singapore? I might rephrase that, how much green cover is left in Singapore? It's a phrase we started using recently. 48%. Really? Half the island has green cover. It includes that strip of grass outside the LT. <laughs> so, that's urban greenery. It's an important element of our lifestyle and you'll see it increasing. But then there's this forest cover that we are particularly interested in. And that forest cover is 14%. And there are two types, unprotected and protected. Of the protected area, we only have 5% nature reserves. This is the highest protection the state can give. Of that 5%, if you wanted to work in a forest with huge, tall trees, the number is now 0.2%. It's going to be hard to find those tiny little spots. So I'm going to focus on the 14%, at least we can see it in a street nearby. And I want to distinguish between the unprotected land and the protected land. So this is where we are in NUS. A hop, skip and a jump away is three patches. Two are unprotected. You can see they're in yellow. One is protected, that's West Coast Park. How are you going to tell when you look at a forest? whether it's protected or unprotected. Just look at Google Maps. So, West Coast Park is green, the other two patches are grey. So you know now. What is state land? Why are we nervous when we get too attached to a forest? That's state land. Well, state land is here today, gone tomorrow. That patch is all clay now, because that was cleared. So interesting when you plan a long-term study and half the forest disappears, like it did to me. But we still have quite a lot of things left in our forest reserve, in all of these forest patches. Plenty of things to explore. The question is, does anybody care? I think they do. I think they care, because we have a program called the International Coastal Cleanup in Singapore. It's been running for 19 years and a lot of these are volunteers. They're all coming. In fact, the only parts of the island we don't clear are areas we are not allowed to go. They're either fenced off, they're under the army. I heard that the army might now allow, allow us to get in. And something like 4,000 people from more than 60 organizations go in. I don't have a budget. They buy their own gloves and trash bags, they hit the shores, all by themselves. So a lot of committed people. 
And because we're such a tiny island, we not only share the problem of there being not enough shores for people to clean, we decided we'll make another mark, which is we get the data up the same day, not two months later, the same day. And everyone submits it, it's calculated, the papers got excited by that trick, so they published the results the next day. The data goes into posters, we've put them up in HDB Heartlands, and we've seen the grim look on a guy in some shorts and a singlet, staring there and looking and pondering. It surprised us, people do care. 80% of our trash is plastic, so it was quite painful for me to drink that coffee out of a styrofoam cup, but I drank it anyway. <laughs> Do we know? So we might care, but do we know what to do? Do we know what's out there? And a bit, a bit of a warning because I was working with the Raffles Museum and I used to recover carcasses. So let's go. Leopard cat, not seen in Singapore since the 60s. A filmmaker saw it. He brought the carcass back. We dissected it and kept it in the museum. One day, someone will appear and says, I want to study leopard cats in Singapore. It had just taken a meal of a bird. So very unfortunate. Malayan pangolin. You may read in the papers, there's a trafficking problem. Smugglers are moving it out of forest from Indonesia, Malaya. People want to eat it. And it's in our forest. This was a roadkill called in by an NTU student and we went to recover the body. We kept it for the day when there would be a pangolin researcher. And, and there was. Almost 10 years later, this is a happier site, a live pangolin in our central catchment. The wild boars have returned. They were extinct in mainland Singapore, you know. They were common in Pulau Ubin, though. And in Pulau Ubin, when they found a dead wild boar, obviously they called me. But you can see, I'm not doing the dissection. These are students, and they did a great job. Mind you, they've not done dissection in school. So I was giving a verbal commentary while they started to carve it up. And their fascination was interesting. <laughs> Someone reported to the papers uh, that there are wild boar in central catchment. Let's go to the sea. Is there anything left in the sea? We've used it as a sewer. Surely nothing's going to come swimming here. Sea cows, why do they come? Can you guess? They come to eat seagrass. So these are all the areas with seagrass populations. Uh, this was a dead female washed up in Pulatakong. And we went to examine her and I dissected her. Uh, first I went to Tang's to buy a really good knife. And then the dissection went smoothly and we found 36 kilograms of seagrass in her stomach and gut. And we called her Diana because this was Tekong area D1. And we buried her. These are dolphin carcasses, not very pleasant, but once in a while they do wash up the shore. And this is happier site, and it's very Singapore. You have dolphins in the foreground and reclamation in the background. <laughs> this is such a picture of wonder and joy. One of our marine scientists, she's been working in seas of Singapore for more than a decade and as the water jostled her, she took several shots. One of these she caught, the dolphin leaping up into the air, falling on its back. Turtles, let me introduce you to Betsy, the green turtle, so the divers know her by name. And she's not the only turtle around. What were these people looking for? Baby turtles follow the stars. In Singapore, East Coast Park is so bright, they think the light bulbs are stars, and they came ashore. And so these members of the public were rescuing them. They were rescued, maybe 76. They could have hatched that morning from anywhere in the region, maybe as far away as Bintan. Let's get muddy. Now this is an animal a lot of you may have seen. This is a monitor lizard. It's wonderful. It can go up to two meters long. It's got these long claws that clatter on this visitor center at Sungai Buloh, reminding me of a velociraptor. 
And guess what? Those claws in the smaller animals help them climb trees. So you don't just look down for a monitor lizard, you have to look up. And this is a close-up. Otters, everyone is sighing. Why do you think I studied otters? I sighed too. And I couldn't find them in Singapore, I had to travel around Southeast Asia. When I finished that work, then they turned up and became permanent residents here. <laughs> so this photo is taken by a friend of mine, Marcus. You can go to Sungai Buloh. You should be able to see them without much difficulty. And they've been seen in many places. So I've received many photographs. This is my favourite. It's called the wedding shoot. And this is in Pongo. So as we finish our construction and the coastline begins to recover, we are not being punished for the sins of the past. Wildlife is kind, or maybe they need a lot of space, and they are turning up. This is a crab-eating water snake, and it's really mysterious, so in the middle of the night, it turns up, it will attack a crab and pull out the legs from the side of its body, because the crabs that we find in the gut are much larger than what a snake could actually bite off with its mouth. And he told an interesting tale, so we were blessed by the visit of Sir David Attenborough. He came here to film Life in Cold Blood. There's a short little eight second piece, I think, in the movie. And you can imagine the people he was surrounded by, they were as if they were in the presence of a holy man. <laughs> they had watched him since they were young. And I was so impressed by the effect he had on everyone. Now, it isn't just a whole bunch of old men going and exploring zoology. Uh, the students are exploring themselves. They get excited by the idea and they come and say, we want to do a project. And depending on their passion, we redirect them to an area suitable for their exploits. So we had a guy, tough guy, very fit, Marcus Joa, willing to spend nights in the forest, so we sent him to pull out a <laughs> To go and see what he could see. It's going to be very tough, we said. And the reason we sent him there, there are three big fragments of forest in Singapore. One is Pulau Ubin. So he went, this small island, 10 km by 2 km, villagers are there, surely they know what's on the island. And after one trip, he said, we think we saw a mouse deer. Nobody believed them, of course, so he took many trips. And finally, a wildlife photographer followed them, and he got wonderful evidence. Somehow they escaped the attention of everyone. And as people were moved out of Pulau Ubin in preparation for reclamation in 2001, the population came out of their secret hiding places and spread around Ubin. So a student researcher spent one night and caught a glimpse of them. This is Marcus, and the press is supportive. So there's an the idea, can Pulau Ubin be used as a wildlife refuge? Nighttime, we leave it to the animals. Daytime, we visit. <laughs> this is waiting. Another student, she looks extremely cheerful. <laughs> she didn't start out being cheerful. She was quite depressed. She set up camera traps, walked many nights, and in the camera traps, instead of finding the, the fruit bandits, she was getting visits by, this is a squirrel. It's a nervous, energetic thing, it'll come and he'll fire off the camera trap, so she had a lot of photos of squirrels. <laughs> Nothing of the animals she wanted to find. But she persisted, and eventually she saw them. The fruit bandits of Sigla, the common palm civet. And you know, as she spent a little bit more time, she became the expert. I said, I have no idea if you might see them in the day. And she started seeing them in the day, and even giving them funny names. <laughs> So the press was supportive again, and this helped because as word spread, people who had been seeing wildlife were interested in sharing their stories with us. So we threw up a Google Docs, put it on the URL that was easy for them to remember, and they started sending in their records. So you can see various people have seen mouse deer and wild boar and silver cats and otters in Singapore. So we said we fit the right person for the job. This is a tough job going into the forest of Singapore in the middle of the night. So who do we choose? A really skinny girl. <laughs> so Yi Teng dwarfed all of us with the effort she spent 
exploring the biology of this crab. You know nothing about this crab, but it's only found in Singapore and nowhere else. Freshwater crabs are threatened in the extinction, one sixth, of, one sixth of them. We have three species, the ones in red. They are all found only in Singapore. This is what we call an endemic species. And they're all new to science as early as the mid 80s. They were all described by Singapore's famous crab man, uh, Peter Ng. <laughs> and this is what one of them looks like, Johora singaporensis. This was put on a stamp. It won him the Heritage Prize. And you can see the eggs under the crab are really big, because unlike marine crabs, they don't send their larvae off to sea and wish them good luck. They hang on to them. We don't neglect even the chickens. <laughs> So the domestic chicken that you see has an ancestor, this wild chicken. They are quite rare in many places because they can interbreed with the domestics. But Singapore is a funny place. We were afraid of bird flu. There was Operation Gallus and all the domestic chickens disappeared overnight. You try going and looking for a domestic chicken. Now that one was seen, it came out in the television. Did you see? Uh, last week, a temple has domestic chicken. It's newsworthy. <laughs> but interestingly, people are seeing chickens and these aren't like the domestics, they can fly and they perch on top of a tree and they make a special call. The call is like the domestic but it's strangled. So the domestic chicken is... <coughs> right, saw that tail off, right? This one is... <coughs> <laughs> Exaggeration. The fascinating thing here to me is Amanda recording the call with her iPhone. <laughs> and there's software for her to figure out the spectrogram. Opportunities are bound to do something. So, Chek Jawa was saved by the public, by the government, interested media, all colluded. We have a wonderful marine paradise there that everyone's keeping a strong eye on. We sent up a blue plan proposal to the government. They accepted it. The minister held it above his head and said, this was wonderful. He'd already read it, wasn't a surprise. <laughs> and URA, how we develop land in Singapore. They ask you, they plead with you to give them feedback. The next time you hear this call, pen your thoughts. They actually look through the feedback. And in Singapore, we have a wonderful lady called Ria Tan. She's an incredible human dynamo. dynamo. <laughs> Just Google while Singapore. <laughs> Everything you need to know, where to go, who to join, places to see, it's all there in Wild Singapore, and I hope some of you will join us and discover your passion. Thank you, everyone.